Be blessed, my brother. Be blessed, my sister. Be blessed wherever this life leads you. Um, we're going to go to Romans 12, too. We're going to pick up where we left off last week. We're going to recap just a little bit, but I think that... Uh, my iPad died, so it told me that I needed to finish some stuff up, right? Remember that? Now it's charged right now. We're going to get through this today. Amen, with the help of the Lord. Romans 12, 2. I'm going to read three or four different versions. Amen? Why don't you get to say praise the Lord? Praise Romans 12, 2. Why don't you get to say thank you, Jesus? I want to let y'all know something that I need participation. You know, when you say amen, I, that means I, 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 you're getting it to me. So when I ask you to talk back, it's just so I know that you're awake and that you're getting it. Amen? amen. All right. Once you get it, say preach, preacher. Preach, preacher. With the help of the Lord. With the help of the Lord, that's what I plan on doing. Amen? Romans 12, 2, it reads, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Another one says, don't be like the people of this world, but let God change the way you think. But let God change the way you think. Then you will know how to do everything that is good and pleasing to him. Another version says, Don't be, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. The last one says this, Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God you'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly, res quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen? Let's pray. Gracious Father, Lord, I just want to thank you, want to bless you, want to praise you, Lord, just... For the opportunity for the moment, Father, if I would, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize that this is a point in time that you foreordained. And so, Lord, I'm going to be your vessel, Lord. Use me as you will to disseminate your word, Father, in a way that, that your people can hear, your people can receive, your people can understand, in a way that your people can apply it, Father God. If I speak your word, you'll watch over your word according to your word to make sure that it goes where you send it to go and that it does not return unto you void. So, Father God, I claim that the minds and the hearts of the people are ready to receive their fertile ground. And, Father God, when your word is planted, they'll bring forth 30, 60, and 100-fold increase. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor say, transform. transform. Don't, conform Don't conform by having, by having a, renewed a renewed mind. mind. Now, let your neighbor look at you and say, transform. Don't conform, Don't conform by having, by having a, renewed a renewed mind. mind. I put your hand on your heart in case new people don't, don't think we're being arrogant, but somebody called us the dream team a long time ago. So look up here at the dream team and say transform. transform. Don't, conform Don't conform by having, by having a, renewed a renewed mind. mind. Say it again. Say, I will. Transform. Transform. I won't, I won't conform, conform by having, by having a, renewed a renewed mind. mind. Amen. You may be seated praising the Lord. Praise God. Now I just want to deal with those, those, those two words. Tiffany, can you put the butterfly up when you get a chance? Not, not right now. Go ahead and do what you got to do. But, uh, I just want to deal, deal with those, those definitions. And, and this week, I think that I'll just throw out a little bit different for you than I did last week. Because last week was a, was a priming week, and it did, we did get some way with it. So I think that those of you that were here can grab a hold of to the, to the things that I just want to say at large. When we're talking about the distinction 
between two things that Paul is telling the Romans right here in this 12th chapter. We're talking about a, a, a small singular scripture that, that gives the option and the opportunity for those that were in reaching of, of Paul's words, or what, those were there in the, in, the, in the arena where Paul was talking, those who received the writing of Paul were given an opportunity. He told them, you, you've operated a certain way. You, you've done things in a certain manner. You, you have tradition, you have heritage, you have a way that you're brought up, you have customs and all these things. He says, however, you, you, you've been taught wrong. You, you've been shown wrong. You, you've lived wrong because of what you initially came in contact with from the time of your birth, and, and you're living it wrong. He says, so, so don't be conformed. Don't be just like this world. Don't just same place, same thing. He says, don't conform. And the word conform means to conform oneself in one's mind and character to another's pattern. Y'all hear that? God made you individually. He made you specifically. He made you purposely. He didn't make you to be like your neighbor. Hello? It says to another's pattern. And it says fashion your oneself according to, to be similar in form or type. It says to agree or to fit in. That's conforming. Synonyms are to match, to fit, to suit, to answer, to agree with, or to be like. Paul says you're not supposed to want to fit in to this culture and into this world. You, you, you're not supposed to just not be different because you don't want conflict. Come on. That, that, that's the problem with the church. A lot of time the church wants to just do what everybody else does. They don't want to distinguish themselves from the rest of the world. They, they want to be like everybody else. I'll, I'll tell you a secret about me. I'm going to preach and teach the word of God. And I'm going to let that decide what happens with this church. I'm going to live a life according to God's principles, and I'm going to let that determine what happens with the church. I'm not going to go out and do a, a psychological analysis on the world and then bring that into the church. I'm going to bring the church into the church and let the church influence the world. Because the church of Christ is greater, is stronger, is bigger, is more powerful, more influential than the world. We just got to act like it. But the church has conformed. Mario, turn this one on. I think this might be off. The church has conformed. And the church has forgotten its identity. And so what Paul did, Paul questions generations and millennials of heritage and told them, you might know something, but it's wrong. And that's a tough thing, right? Well, my mama taught me this. What did, he, what did he tell mama and the water boy? He told the water boy, mama was wrong again, right? <laughs> remember that the water boy? You guys remember that? And water boy was got, he got fired up. Because how can my mama be wrong? She carried me in the womb. She taught me. She, she gave me everything. She got, how can mama be wrong? Because mama didn't know. Amen. The word says my people perish for lack of knowledge. Yeah, on, He's talking about the church. The church perishes because the church doesn't have knowledge. Come on. Amen? Conform. And transform, we said conform was a, a noun. And transform is a verb. It's to make a thorough or dramatic change in the form, appearance, or character of. Thorough. That means that you come from the egg to the butterfly. Thorough. That means that what you become does not resemble who you were. That means that when you come into who you are, people don't recognize you by who you were. That means that when your testimony speaks greater now, the trials that you went through don't even have a bite in you. That means that the stuff that life has handed you and the things that you've fought against and struggled against and have beat you up and have tossed you around to and fro, all they were doing was bringing your development into the who you are now. That means
means the necessity of what you had to go through was something that you really had to go to to get to the place where God can actually develop you to the point where God can ultimately use you. But you don't look like you used to look like. So you don't talk like you used to talk like. You don't think like you used to think like. You don't do like what you used to do like because you become a transformed person. But the challenge of the transformation is strong. Synonyms are to change, to alter, to convert. The literal meaning in, 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 the, in the Greek is to metamorphose or metamorphosize, which means you come from one thing to another, right? Transfigure, transmute, or to mutate, all right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about two choices. We're talking about stay the same, blend in, fit in, exist, Complacency versus changing the world. That's really it. Okay? All right. Now, we said last week that uh, transforming takes willingness, right? It takes willingness. You have to be willing to transform, right? You, you, you have to want to transform. You have to want to become different. You have to want to. And I'm just going to go over these briefly. Uh, the, the, Jesus came to his disciples and said, follow me. Right? And that's what he told them. And I'll make you fishers of men. So they had to decide if they wanted to leave their comfort zone. They had to decide in an instant if they wanted to be challenged by the differences that this new man was asking them something about. So they followed him. And there was one of his disciples that says, I got I to gotta bury my father. And Jesus told him, let the dead bury the dead. Either you come with me now or you don't come with me ever. And it wasn't that his, his dad had died, but in tradition, you didn't leave your home until your parents had passed away. Right? But he said, let, your, let the dead bury the dead. I want to bring you to a place of life. That's a transforming thought process. And then a rich young ruler in Mark the Mark, the 10th chapter, came up to Jesus and said, Good master, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm talking about the same things, y'all. And, and, and then he said, Why do you call me good? Only God is good. He says, But since you want to know, I said, he said, I got the key. He said, What, what, what about the Ten Commandments? What about, what about the, 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 the law? Have you kept all? He said, All the things. I have not committed adultery. I haven't stolen. I haven't done anything. I've, I've kept all the letter of the law since I was a child. And Jesus looked him square and I said, That's good. He said, But one thing you lack. He said, take all your stuff that you have, sell it all, and give it to the poor, and come and follow me. But it said that the man had great wealth. He was rich. He had a lot of money. He had a lot of power. He had a lot of influence. So he's able to, you know, he was able to create the world that he wanted to. And, and so he was tormented or tortured or vexed by what Jesus said. So he did not sell his stuff. He did not Give it away to the poor. He walked away, and the word said he walked away sad because he was very rich. He was not willing to be transformed. Transformation takes willingness. Come on, y'all. Transformation takes effort. You got to try at this thing. You got to want to see who you are and become who you should be. So it takes effort. So, so if someone tells you something that you don't like to hear, instead of putting up your dukes and wanting to fight, why don't you ingest it a little bit, mull it over, and think about what God is saying through that person to you. It takes effort to become different. See, some people can pick up something and be good at it right away. But the best of the best of the best, not only are they good at something, but they put practice into becoming great at something. It takes effort. And we said transforming takes purging, right? You need to get rid of certain mindsets, relationships, and attitudes. Your body's smart enough to purge you when something's going to make you sick. So your spirit definitely knows that you should be purged of things that are going to make you complacent. Amen? Transforming takes honesty. In order for anything to move in anybody's life, there's got to be honesty. Have you ever been confronted with a situation over and over and over again? And you keep wondering why this 
Same thing keeps happening. Come on, y'all. And, and you keep wondering why, well, I moved from Kentucky to here. Why do I meet up with the same type of people that's in Kentucky? Hmm, go to Japan. I don't even know the culture. I, they, they speak in a different language, and I'm running into the same type of people. The thing is, everywhere you go, that's where you are. The people aren't speaking your language. You're speaking your language. And you have to be honest with yourself if you're going to transform. You got to know that you don't have it all together. You got to know that, that maybe you brought some things from your past. You got to know that maybe your actions and your reactions aren't the way they should be. But you got to be honest with yourself. You don't need to tell me what you think I need to hear. You don't need to tell your neighbor what they, you think they need to hear. What you have to do is be willing to be honest for the per, to the person that's inside before transformation can ever begin to take place. Amen? And transforming, it takes time. It takes time, guys. It just literally takes time. Sometimes we come to the church and, and we think that everything is going to happen like that. I call it the microwave society, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? You go to the, to the microwave and you push the popcorn button and you pop the popcorn. Not in my house. It was a skill. You had to learn how to pop popcorn, right? You had to learn how to shake that, that, that skillet just right and get it heated up. You, it was a skill. It was an art form. And I got to admit it to you guys, I never learned how to pop popcorn. I was too young because my cousin used to have to put the rag on the skillet. Come on, y'all. My cousin Elaine, and she, she, she starts shaking that. It make that noise, right? Then she had a skillet on the, the little top pot on the top of the skillet, right? You could hear it. Then it started pop, pop, pop. Man, it sounded good, right? But, but now we go to the microwave, and we press the burrito button. And the burrito that was frozen for six years that we just got out of the freezer, right, is ready in three minutes. So, so we, think that, we think that everything should happen like that. We think that we, we, we don't know something, so we get a hold of our smartphone, our smart device, and, and we don't have some knowledge in here because we, come on, y'all, because we haven't taken the time to read on it. We haven't taken time to experience it in life. We haven't taken time for someone to correct us and direct us along the way. We haven't taken time to let somebody else tell us how to do something and tell somebody to get under my wing and let me mentor you because it takes time to develop into the person that God wants you to be. We've decided that we want to circumvent everything and I want to get over here because I've seen somebody there, but you forgot the reason why the butterfly can be the butterfly is because it went through every stage before became the butterfly. You cannot circumvent what God is trying to do. It takes time. It takes time. The vision is because God put it in you. The work is because God is making you. Amen? The vision is because God put it there. The work is because God is making you become there. Amen? That's all I want to touch on about last week. Now I wanna I wanna go into this and see what we can come up with. The last thing I wanna say before that is be you wanna become coachable, right? You always wanna be able to be taught something. Amen? You don't ever want to become a person who knows it all. You wanna become a person who can learn. Again and again and again. Amen? So let's talk about Paul a little bit. What gave Paul the right to confront a people and tell them how wrong they were? Paul had two resumes, y'all. He had a resume that started in the book of Acts, and that says something different in the book of I believe it's the book of Corinthians. So Paul started off in the book of Acts when he was at the martyrdom of Stephen in the seventh chapter. That's when Stephen was, was preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ and all the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees got together and they stoned him to death. They killed him because of his belief. They, they said they bit him, they, they stoned him, they beat him up and, and he died. And when he died, they said they, they, they stripped him of his clothes and they put his clothes at Saul's feet meaning that Saul was there 
and consenting to what they did to Stephen. So Saul himself in the Acts, the chapter, the ninth chapter, has letters that give him authority. And he has the letters that, 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 that give him the authority to, to, to persecute the church, to, to, to have them in prison, to have them go before the, the squads, if you will, and to have them persecuted in any way, shape, or form. So he has the authority. And he's a Pharisee. So he's going, and you know the story on the road to Damascus, he's blinded. And he's struck down, and he comes to his senses, and he says, the word of the Lord comes to him and says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he says, who art thou? He says, I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. And he says, what will you have me to do? So we're talking about Saul before he becomes Paul. And then Jesus gives him the instructions. What gives him the right to tell the Romans that they had it so wrong? Because this is what he says in Philippians, the third chapter. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any man think that he has wherever he might trust in the flesh, I the more. Paul said, I was circumcised on the eighth day, the stock of Israel from the tribe of Benjamin. Come on, y'all. A Hebrew of Hebrews that's touching the law of Pharisee. He's just like the rich young ruler. Concerning the zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteous, which is the law. He said, I was blameless. He said, but those, what those things were to gain to me, for those things I count loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but the, for the loss of the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do not count them but dung. He said, when I was on the road to Damascus, I was, I was prideful. I was arrogant. I knew who I was. I knew where I came from. I knew the ladies. Come on, he came from Benjamin. That's one, of, that's one of Israel's original sons. Benjamin was the youngest son. Paul said, I came from there. My lineage comes from deep. He said, my people roll deep. We got a reputation. We are somebodies. I'm not a nobody. He said, I'm somebody. He said, I'm a Roman citizen and a citizen of Israel. I'm taught the best. I studied on Gamaliel. I got, a, I got a three degrees and, and I write books and people invite me and I get money for speaking engagements. I'm somebody. I was on the road with the mindset that I'm somebody. I got this power. I got this authority. And the Christian church was scared of me. I had them shook up. My name, they hold my name. They heard my name. They shook. He said, because I knew who I was. He said, but all that I learned, he said, I counted as dung, as refuse, as nothing to be counted as good. He said, because it counted for nothing for me. He said, I had to denounce that I came from the stock of Benjamin. That don't bring me home. He said, I had to denounce that I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. That don't bring me home. I had to renounce of who I came from. That don't bring me home. He said, I had to give it all up because I needed to be transformed. I had to give it all up. I had to let it all go. I had to let it all go because it didn't matter. I had to let them thousands of years go because it didn't matter. I had to let that pride go because it did not matter. But when Jesus blinded him on the road to Damascus, he could have told Jesus, do you know who I am? You blinded the wrong one. I'm somebody. I come from somewhere and I'm doing something. But he was humble enough to accept that he might be wrong. He was humble enough to just admit maybe, just maybe, I might not have it all together. So when Paul approaches the Romans, he says, you were just like me. Come on. He said, I was the same way that you are. He said, so I'm going to give you my testimony. Come on, y'all. Importance of a testimony. I'm going to speak a language to you that you'll understand. And I didn't know what God was doing when he did it at the time. I, I haven't shared this with anybody else, Romans. But on that road, I, I, I had my encounter. I was just like you. I was taught to traditions. I was taught the, the heritage. I was taught the lineage. But guess what? It didn't matter. It lines up to be nothing to me. Because all that I was doing was going to get me nowhere. 
All the power influence that I had was going to get me nowhere. All that I was doing was going to get me nowhere. That's why the battle is, church. The battle is right there between every last one of us. Because as soon as I start telling you that maybe you learned something wrong. That's right. That's what you say. Start talking back. As soon as I will tell you to look into the word and get rid of these religious dogma. As soon as I tell you to look at the word and, and get rid of these traditions of men. As soon as I look at this word and you tell me, but I'm 55, I'm 60 years old, and I was taught this way since I was a youth. Yeah, but it was wrong. But I spent so much time doing it. I, I spent my whole life doing it. I've been dedicated to it. Yeah. It's still wrong. But, 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 but my, my so-and-so, my such-and-such, and, and this group would crowd me, and everybody, th- they did the same thing. And, yeah. But it still was wrong. And, and I got some evidence for you. Those people that taught you what they taught you, those people that showed you what they showed you, those people that were teaching you what they were teaching you, where are they in their Christian walk? I, I can guarantee you this. If you go back to where they were, that's exactly where they're going to be. Oh, y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. Y'all missed it. And I'm not talking bad about anybody. I'm not talking bad about anybody. If you don't know, you just don't know. But this is it. If you're not challenged by the word of God, then you'll never change. And if you don't get it today, then let it be a seed. And maybe it'll take a year. It might take two years. It might take three years. And one day you might wake up and say, now I know what Pastor was talking about. That stuff that I believe, that stuff that I was taught, that stuff that I cut it up to, that stuff that I thought was great, it counts as dumb. It don't matter to me. It was getting me nowhere because I'm still in the same place that I was then. We can't change the world until we let the word change us. Some of us just need to do this. We need to quit holding on to what we know is not right. That's it. We need to quit holding on to what we know is not right. Because you know what you're doing and expecting something different to happen? You're operating in what's called insanity. That's a literal (laughs) definition of insanity. Doing the same thing but expecting different results. If you're being the same person and expecting stuff to change, you're acting like you're insane. That's the dictionary definition. That's the dictionary definition. I'm not calling you insane. I'm I'm really not. All I'm saying is, let's be challenged by what the word says. Let's let's be challenged by, if if we're going to be frustrated with God, God, things haven't changed, it's because you haven't allowed God to change you. God, things aren't moving, it's because you're you're not moving. God, things aren't, aren't happening, it's because you're not allowing God to come in and rule and to uproot those things in your life that need to be ruled and changed and uprooted. God, you're not listening. No, you're not listening to God. That's why things aren't happening. So the thing is, we have to be able to be challenged by a word and receive a word and let it become a a part of us. And then we have to walk in it, knowing that it's going to take time. But the thing is, if you don't want to be the same, then stop acting the same. If you don't want to do the same thing, then quit doing the same. If you don't want to talk the same, then quit talking the same. If you don't want to react the same, then quit reacting the same. If you want to be changed, let the transformation take place. Say, I won't talk like that. I won't act like that. I won't think like that. I won't do like that. I refuse because I'm different. And even if today you're still the same like you were, you just get up in the morning and say, I'm different. And if it don't happen the next day, you get up the next day and say, I'm different. And you keep on putting in your mind and in your heart that you're
acting different, and before you know it, you'll be acting different because that's what you planted inside of you, and your spirit took a root, and it took a hold, and things started changing from the inside out. So how can I tell you that you got it all wrong? Because of who I was. I tell you my resume. This is my resume. I was fast. I was strong. I could do all kinds of stuff. In the old high school, they'll tell you even right now that I was the best athlete, pure athlete, to ever go through in the old high school. The coaches will tell you that today. But guess what that got me? Nothing. I'm not, I'm not lying to you. I was bad. I got a full ride scholarship. Guess what that got me? Nothing. I was so bad. I, I was at a trial meet, Troy Aikman, Carnell Lake for the, for the San Diego Chargers. I'm up there backpedaling, running a 40. What that get me? Nothing. I remember the Miami Dolphins came through. I ran a 4-3-2 on grass. I had a scout who gives, who times people for a living, shook his head. He said a bad word, y'all. He said, bleep, he's fast. Guess what that got me? Nothing. I got to go to Canada and a whole nother country making over $50,000 a year in 1989. And guess what that got me? Nothing. Y'all didn't hear me. Y'all didn't hear me. I'm trying to give y'all my resume. I'm trying to tell you who I was. But see, it was a time in my life where I knew everything was broke. I was tired of me. I was sick of me. I couldn't rely on me. I was broke, busted, and disgusted. I had all the talent in the world, but I was an empty shell of a man. I had nothing going on. I had nothing. And then Jesus himself laid me out. And he said, why are you picking against these pricks? He said, you're trying to do it the wrong way. You know you can't do it without me. Yeah, you strong, you fast, but you can't do it without me. I need to come in and rearrange and transform you. So how come I could tell you something? Because I've been through something. I've been right where you are. I'm just like Paul talking to the Romans. You got it all wrong. I thought it was about me when it's about Jesus. I thought it was about the accolades I'm supposed to get when it's about the accolades he's supposed to get. That's why I could talk to you like this. I've been right where you are, church. Amen? So after Paul went through all what he went through, He said this in 2 Corinthians. He said, this is new resume, y'all. Remember the first one was talking about where he came from, who he was? Come on, y'all. He said, do they brag about being Hebrews and Israelites? He said, from the pure race of Abraham. He said, I'm their match. Are they servants of Christ? Question mark. I can go to them. I can go to them even one better. He said, I can't believe I'm saying these things. He said, it's crazy to talk this way. He said, but I started, I'm going to finish. He said, I've worked much harder, been jailed more often, beaten up more times than I can count, and at death's door time after time. I've been flogged five times with the Jews, I've been flogged five times with the Jews, 39 lashes, beaten by the Romans, rods three times, pummeled with rocks once. I've been shipwrecked three times and immersed in the open sea for a night and a day. In a hard traveling year, I've been hard traveling year and in and out. He said, I've had to ford rivers, fend off robbers, struggle with friends, struggle with foes. I've been at risk in the city. I've been at risk in the country, endangered by the desert sun and by the sea storms and betrayed by those who I thought were my brothers. He said, I've known drudgery and hard labor. Many a long, lonely night without sleep. Many a missed meal, blasted by the cold, naked to the weather. And that's not the half of it. When you throw in the daily pressures and anxieties of all the churches, when someone gets to the end of his rope, I feel the desperation in my bones when someone is duped into sin. 
an angry fire burns in my gut. If I have to brag about myself, I'll brag about the humiliation that make me like Jesus. The eternal and blessed God and fast father of our master, Jesus, knows that I'm not lying. You got to understand where Paul came from. Paul said, once upon a time, I would have told you who I was because I thought that mattered. He said, now my resume is they beat me. He said, my resume is they put me in jail. My resume is I was bitten by snakes and I was turned upside down because I was preaching and teaching the gospel. He said the reason why they did it to me was because I was no longer kumbaya. I was no longer saying que sera, sera. I was no longer just trying to get along. He said I became the man that God challenged me to become and therefore it endangered me. But I must rather glory in that testimony that brings him glory than what I thought I was supposed to be about. He had a different resume, y'all. He had a different resume. Amen? Y'all got that? Amen. Okay, I'm going to give y'all a few things and I'm going to let you go. All right? This is a litmus test for you. This is personal. And the question reads... Are you conformed or transformed? All right? Y'all got it? I got 12 points. I'm not going to expound on them, but you can write them down if you want to. Number one, a conformed person serves self. Put self first, while a transformed person serves others and puts others first. Which one are you? Don't answer. Right? Number two, did y'all get that? Number two, a conformed person seeks glory and praise. Look at me, look at me. I've been there. While a transformed person gives God the glory and praise. Which one are you? Number three, a conformed person remains the same year to year, situation to situation, And a transformed person is completely different from who they were year to year and situation to situation. Number four, a conformed person is full of worry, fear, and doubt, while a transformed person trusts in the Lord and walks by faith. Come on, y'all. Number five, a conformed person relies on self and plans A, B, and C, one, two, three, while a transformed person relies on plan G-O-D. Amen? That means that you rely on what God says. Amen? All right. A conformed person, number six, seek ways to blame others. Yep, y'all heard me. And this one, this one we're going to go into not today. A conformed person seeks ways to blame others, while a transformed person seeks to forgive. A lot of reasons why people stay stuck in life is because every single thing that someone will challenge you about, you will say, I'm like this because I'm still blaming so-and-so. And you don't say, I'm still blaming so-and-so. You say, because this happened to me. And therefore, you cannot grow and develop because you still blame while a transformed person seeks to forgive and forgiveness releases them but more importantly releases you you stay married and bound to that person to that situation to that instance in your life as long as you keep blaming that person and that instance don't you understand that you married to the devil that wounded you Because every time you think about why you don't forgive them, the face comes in, the situation comes in, the same feelings come in, and so therefore you stay married to the person that did you the most damage. And if you would seek to forgive that person, you cut them off, you don't have to think about them anymore, you're released from them, and you could grow into the things that God has for you. A transformed person seeks to forgive. I'm never saying that what they did to you was right. I'm just saying it's still dominate and dogging your life do you want to take that to the grave with you 
That's what we sometimes do. Amen? Number seven. A conformed person lives to fight and make discord, while a transformed person lives to make peace. Yep. Number eight. A conformed person is just like their surroundings, while a transformed person influences their surroundings as an ambassador of heaven. Amen? Number nine. A conformed person forces things, while a transformed person flows with the Spirit and God's will. You know, the worst thing that we can do is always try to figure out how we're going to do something when we know that God hasn't ordained for us to do it. Mm -hmm. Number 10, a conformed person has their personal agenda built on their personal desires, their wants, and their wishes, and their needs. While a transformed person has a selfless agenda that is orchestrated and designed by God's personal and individual calling for you. Y'all got that? Number 11. A conformed person continually defaults to bad habits, bad behaviors, addictions, attitudes, and familiar things. While a transformed person personifies the newness that transformation births, you become born again. Amen? Number 12, this is the last one. A conformed person is ruled by external occurrences and their emotions. You live in reaction. While a transformed person is ruled by the truths of God that never change. Amen? Y'all got all 12 points? All right. I think the Lord has released me from this. Amen. Stand up with me if you will. Let me encourage you. Let me speak a life to you. You can depend on God to see you through. You can depend on me to pray for you.